Hi and welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Simon and this is the start of a new reading blog slash reader's journal and I'm gonna have archived the other two but I will leave links them down below because today is March the 24th, it's a Sunday, it's also my 42nd birthday and I have decided, I am determined actually, it's not just decided, determined, I'm going to vlog every day of my 42nd year. I know some of you are about to say it's my 43rd year, let's all move swiftly on because I don't care for that fact. I thought I would just have a very quick catch up with you now because I'm off out for the day to Powys, to the wonderful Powys Castle and I'm going to be heading there with Chris shortly and he has no idea that my mum and my stepdad are going to join us and then we're going to go and wander the castle, wander the grounds, possibly head over to Oswestry Street and go to book a bookshop and then have tea out and it'll be lovely. So I'm very, very, very excited for it. I am planning from tomorrow getting a wriggle on finally with the 016 books and they are the Women's Prize for Fiction Longlist 2024 and that is what most of the reading in this vlog is going to be. I have actually started one and got halfway through it and then decided to not read it for now, although the lovely Joseph at Foyle's Cafe, hello Joseph, he told me that I should keep going with it and I did record some footage of that which I will include whenever I decide to head back to it because I definitely will now, thanks to Joseph. I'm also, I've decided, going to try and squeeze in a few books here and there that aren't women's prize books just to keep it, you know, different, keep it, what's the word, not womish because I'm reading, well it is womish because I'm going to read these sort of in an order that I feel, although sort of not, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. What I'm going to start my 42nd year reading is this, which is Kylie by Adrian Renzo and Liz Guifra. And I absolutely love this album. It's the first album I ever, well, I can't say I bought it. I asked for it back in 1988 when I was six. And I have never found a book that really, I love pop music so much and I've never found a book that has encapsulated that and certainly not one about one of the most like, I guess, important albums or sort of nostalgic albums or, I mean, I still love Kylie all these years on. How old was I then? Six. That was 36 years ago. Oh my Lord. No. Not 36 years ago, surely not. Maybe it is. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. I don't know how much I'll tell you about it. I don't really know what to expect from it at all. But um, yeah, that's the one that I'm going to be starting off. But then I'll be heading to those from tomorrow because I think I'm going to get this done today. I need to go. I need to crack on. need to get a wriggle on. I will see you when I'm back from Paris, if not tonight, then tomorrow for a natter. And to let you know what I'm going to be starting with first from this year, 16 long, long list of books. I'm very excited for them. I've heard very mixed things, but I'm very excited. Anyway, I'll speak to you all later. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy 
birthday, dear Simon. Happy birthday to you. Hope everyone, it is now Monday. I had the loveliest time at Powys. After a very grey morning, it got really sunny just as we got there and was just delightful. Um, we spent so much time wandering around and guessing that we didn't actually get to go to Oswestry and didn't go book shopping. And actually, I didn't even buy any secondhand books in the National Trust secondhand bookshop. However, what I did get in the gift shop was not one, but two bookmarks. I say I got them, Chris got them for me, and one is a Castle Powys. <laughs> bookmark. I'm going to start collecting these everywhere I go. In fact, I've been doing it for the last couple of weeks. And then the other one is, and I've already got one of these, but I love them. This is a bookmark made out of vintage Welsh blanket and they're just lovely. And I've got a really sort of pastely oranges and turquoisey one. And then this is a darker sort of purpley one and green. I love purple. So I've got those. I also read pretty much two thirds of Kylie last night and I was not expecting this to be the book that it was. I finished it not long ago actually. I should say I need to be quite quick on this one because we're off to take Biscuit to the vets for the first time. I know some of you were like why has Biscuit not already been in the video? Well he'll be with us soon. Anyway, I won't go into too much detail on this. Suffice to say, it wasn't the book that I was expecting. It really gave me a really different insight into what it was like to be queer in Australia at the time that this came out and how the queer community took it on, but also how misogynistic and misguided the record uh, labels were at the time. Plus, I didn't know there was so much venom for this album and for Kylie herself at the time. So yeah, there we go, there was that. Now, I am, once I'm back from the aforementioned vets, going to start on a Women's Prize read, finally. I have got just under a month to get them all read, so I need to try and do four a week. That is my aim. I picked up the book that, when I judged them by their first sentence, really, really hooked me by its first sentence, as you might have guessed. That was River East, River West by Orb Ray Lescure. The first line of this is, just as a reminder, one second caller, a man called Lu Fang stole Alba's mother in Grand Ballroom B of Shanghai's Imperial Hotel. That to me really intrigued me. Now what I'm going to do as I go through the uh, 16 books on the Women's Prize for Fiction long list 2024 is go back to the first line see how I get on with it but also I thought I would let you know what the cover or anything else says to me and then when I finished it I'm going to steal what mum is doing with her Women's Prize for non-fiction long list videos and see how this book rates against the criteria for me as well as what I thought about it. There won't be any spoilers as I go through. I will just tell you little bits about the plot and how I'm getting on with it and all that kind of stuff. But the cover and the title, now I don't know much about this book. In fact, I don't know much about any of the Women's Prize long listed books. As you may have gathered, if you saw me and mum unboxing them and just me generally going, oh my goodness, I've not heard of that. Oh my goodness, I didn't guess that. Oh my goodness, I have not heard of that. Very exciting though. This, from what I remember, is set in two different time periods in Shanghai, which the cover is kind of giving for me. I don't know if you feel the same, but with the different tones of these buildings, it's almost like they're overlapping a little bit. And I don't know if that's sort of symbolising time, but also for me, I feel like this might be a book about where cultures clash and come together, which is some of my favourite kind of fiction when it's done super duper well. That is literally all I have for you on what this might be about. I know no more. I'm going to it pretty much with no knowledge. Well, you've gathered that, I'm sure. Oh, I've just realised it does go quite nicely with this jumper though. And also actually it goes really nicely with Biscuit. For those of you going, what on earth do you keep talking about Biscuit for? Biscuit is the cat that we adopted last week and has joined our household, who I actually need to get a wriggle on and go and uh, take to the vets. So what I thought I would do, because that's all I've got lined up, and I should say I'm off this week and have very little plans. I just want to have a really chilled week. But while I'm at the vets, I thought I would share with you the footage that we got on the day we went to go and get Biscuit. And then I'll catch up with you about this and about how he got on at the vets later. I will see you then. Chris, <laughs> where are we? 
We are parked outside. Don't say exactly where it is. No. That would be weird. A cashery. And why are we at a cashery? Because we're here to pick up a little gentleman called Jeremy. Possibly seen to be called Stanley. There may be a name change. We'll see. Anyway, yeah, we're very excited. We're very early. Very early. And we want to get this little, little boy. Ginger kitten. Very excited. He's not a kitten. He's, not he's a, a kitten. cat. He's nine. He's little. He is very little. Anyway, that's what we're doing. We've got a little cat in the car. You excited, Chris? Yeah. Did you cry? <laughs> Jerry almost. Hello, good boy. Welcome Hello. 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 Good boy. What's this? Hey. Hi. Can you give me a pop? After the books. Good boy. As you can see, I'm back at home with biscuits. So I'm trying to use my head to cover up the plug there. He did really well at the vets. He was checked. We had to get him checked to see if he has been neutered, and it wasn't a very uh, what's the word? Well, it was quite a degrading experience for him in front of an audience. Anyway, he has been neutered. They were going to do a blood test to see if he's got an inverted testicle because he has been humping a little bit. And uh, apparently it could, though, be behavioural. So we'll see. Um, hopefully it is something and nothing. As the Cats Protection thought, he is about nine. He hasn't got any front teeth at all. And um, yeah, he's just a little love, just a crazy ginger, as you can see. And we love him for it. So yeah, he's very, 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 very lovely. Anyway, I'm going to give you a quick update because I have since read the first, well, look, I'm using my uh, Powers Castle bookmark. I've read the first 70 or so pages of River East, River West. And it's about a, well, it starts off the first part of the book because I'm on part, well, I've just finished part two, but the first part of the book is all about Alva and it starts off with her mother being stolen by Lu Fang, although, as we realise, it's not really being stolen, it's actually the fact that Lu Fang has married her mother. And Lu Fang is a Chinese man in Shanghai and her mother is a American and Alva is half American, half Chinese, although she doesn't know who her father is. Um, he's quite often described as just a squirt of spunk. So it's actually a wedding, not a proper stealing, but it was still, I was still really, really intrigued by it. And we learned the dynamic between the three of them is a little bit awkward, to put it mildly. But also we learned about the fact that Alva is a young woman struggling both with her identity as a Chinese American in Shanghai, and also how that is for her at school, where she's being brought up in a public Chinese school, but she dreams of being part of a private American school. And then, as we kind of get into the grips of that, we then flip back to the 1980s, where we meet Lu Fang, and where... So I'm just going to knock the camera over, aren't you? We get to know the life that Lu Fang had back then. And it's really complex. There's a very saucy scene in it that I wasn't expecting, but also gives us an insight into Shanghai at that time too. So that's where we are. That's what's going on so far. I'm very much enjoying it. I think it's going to alternate between Alva and Lu Fang um, as we go along kind of Alva, uh, well, from uh, post her mother's marriage, but also then Lu Fang all those years ago up to now. So I'm intrigued. There we are. That's my thoughts. I'm going to go. I'll speak to you anon. Hi everyone, it's now Tuesday and it's about 6pm and I have a confession to make. I have not read as much of River East River West as I would like. I am 
over halfway. However, I was planning on caning this and reading it today, but I started watching Buying Beverly Hills last night and watched about four episodes and then had to watch the other six this morning. So it's the fault of reality TV and me being far too invested in the lives of Kyle from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and her husband Mauricio, who is the main sort of part of buying Beverly Hills. So yeah, they've had a difficult time and I have been gripped by it and I'm slightly ashamed of that. Anyway, let's get back to this book, which I have been gripped by half the time and haven't been so gripped the rest of the time. I am finding Lu Fang's story really fascinating. I can't give too much away because there are various things that happen that, yeah, I don't want to reveal to you. I think it's, in, well, I think it's nice to discover those yourselves. It's not that I'm not enjoying Alva's story, but I will say I feel like it's a little bit more melodramatic in a kind of teenage girl kind of way. And whilst I think there's some really interesting discussion around education, around not knowing your roots and your cultural heritage or only knowing half of it, which weirdly is something that I can really relate to because I didn't know my dad until I was 16, so I didn't really know anything about his side of the family. And actually I didn't discover that I have Romani heritage from that side of the family until a couple of years ago when I did a campaign for Ancestry. Anyway, so that I, I think is really interestingly done. I do love the way it is looking at these two cultures of Chinese and American coming together and where they sort of clash, where they're like magnets, kind of polar opposites and pushing each other away, which also kind of links in with Alva and her mother Sloan because their relationship is a bit like that. They've been really tight, however, since she's married Lu Fang or since she's even been with Lu Fang, that has sort of pushed them apart a lot more and they're sort of orbiting around each other in a slightly tricky way, whilst also Sloane seeming to really not want for Alva to know much about her American family history or even Sloane's life, and yet she's now become friends with an American girl at school, and so that's kind of coming to the fore. So that's really, really interestingly done, but there is just every so often a little bit too much teen angst, which I'm just not about at 42, I won't lie. And it's done well, but it's just not hooking me in like the situation back in the 1980s with Lu Fang. I think we're gonna go into the 90s soon. The writing is really good. I will say there's a few things that are a little bit repetitive. And um, there's actually one paragraph that I meant to read to you yesterday and can't find now, where the same words are used like six times in the paragraph. And I was like, come on, you don't need that. And also that whole thing that I mentioned about her father being a squirt of sperm, that has come up a lot. I feel like, I don't know, once is fine, twice is okay, more than that I don't think is necessary. But I do love the way that Aubrey Lescure writes about food and also you get a real insight into the different parts of Shanghai almost through class, which is really interesting. We've been to some really rich high rises. We've been in a private compound. We've been down to the 24 hour gaming areas. You know, we've been through all sorts of parts through this story and also getting some of the history. And one part of this book, which again, I can't spoil, but there was something that I learned about the one child policy that was so shocking to me. I literally had to stop for a minute and put the book down. And I kind of feel like there could be more of that in here there kind of hasn't been but when it happens I'm really like oh my goodness this is so interesting so and that was kind of grimly horrific to read but also really eye-opening and just really kind of hit me with a real emotional punch so yeah I think it's really good so far I want maybe the teenage angst to calm down a little bit I mean is it going to, doesn't necessarily tend to in novels about teenagers, but there we go. So that's where we are with it. I now need to, before I head to reading more and hopefully finishing it tonight, if not tomorrow morning, go and feed Foster across the road. I've become the crazy cat man currently feeding four cats. Uh, yeah, our neighbours are away and we'll be back by the time this goes live. So that's not like I'm leaving them vulnerable in any way before someone says it, because somebody probably bloody well will, because that's what the internet is like, isn't it? I've had a few people tell me they don't like Biscuit's name, hilarious, but I've also had recently, and I'm noticing it's becoming a bit 
of a thing again, you put something delightful, like I put, you know, Powis on Instagram on what a great day I'd had, and people are like, oh, I don't like peacocks. And I'm like, why do you need to tell me the negative out of an amazing day? There was a fabulous four poster bed. There was an amazing library. There was lovely pictures of me and my mum. Why focus on the things that you don't like? I find that really odd and it's beginning to get a bit prevalent again on social media. Anyway, moving on, I'm going to feed Foster. So let's go and see him. And then I will catch up with you, hopefully when I finish this, either later or tomorrow. Hi Foster, have you come to greet me? Are you hungry, hey? Foster, look at me. Hi. Foster. Hello? Hello? And Foster, you're not meant to go upstairs. You've got to come and have your dinner. Come on, Foster. Are you going to come have your dinner? Oh, you're purring. Hey? You going to come have your dinner? Don't want to leave you alone. Maybe. Oh, there we go. We gave two strokes. <gasps> Just a bit scared. Hello, Loxie. Hi everyone, it is now Wednesday, it's about midday, it's been a bit of a morning. I've been hoping to get the Women's Prize for Non-Fiction shortlist arriving this morning to film a unboxing video before it's announced later on today. However, not one, but two couriers have failed to get the books here. I don't think one of them even picked them up and the other one I think got lost. Anyway, what I'll do is insert here what my predictions would be. I don't really have any skin in the game yet because I haven't read the long list. Mum has been and has been absolutely loving it. I can also now finally watch her videos because I think I'm going to be making a video so I can't be swayed in any way which I was a little bit worried about. I will try to remember to report back later on what it was on the list and if I was right or not but I will be reading all of the Women's Prize for Nonfiction shortlist at some point before the winner is announced in June when the winner of the Women's Prize for Fiction will also be announced. Speaking of which I have finished my first Women's Prize for Fiction long-listed book 2024. It's River East River West as you know. I really enjoyed this book. It's a really solid book which sounds like a backhanded compliment but I promise it's not. I was definitely intrigued by it. I was invested. The issues that I had that I mentioned around Alva and her part of the story, sorry, biscuits shouting at the door, this has not happened before, need a little what's in. The Alva parts that I was a bit worried about did get a lot better and I got more invested emotionally actually as they went on and I thought the way that through her eyes we saw some changes in China that come about was really definitely done again, again around that American China where things come together where they are kind of polar opposites or, or magnetized against each other what's that term called I can't think anyway that I thought that was pretty done I was much more interested in Lu Fang's story I have to admit like in order to be completely honest I, I found his story also incredibly emotional as it went on and there's a lot of moral questions within his story that the book gets you to think of. There's also a lot of heartbreak. Um, I thought the way it looked at how China has changed through his eyes was fascinating. I will say sometimes with the historical elements and when big things happened, it did feel a bit like you'd get the instant impact and reaction of them and then they sort of fade. There wasn't any sort of ripple effect that I was kind of hoping for, but that, you know, is just me possibly being a little bit picky. I thought this was, a, like I said, a really solid novel and I will definitely be reading more of Aubrey Lescure, whatever she writes. Now, as I mentioned, like how Mum has compared the books on the long list to the criteria of the prize, I'm going to do the same. So the three, yes, I did do three right, I had to question myself then. Three elements of criteria are, firstly, accessibility. Would totally say this book is accessible. I felt I learned a lot about China that I didn't know and its history through this book. As I said, was maybe like a little bit more depth and a little bit more ripples of that as it went on. That didn't happen, but I still would say it's definitely accessible in all those ways. In terms of originality, which is the second of the criteria, I guess I think it's pretty original. It's really tricky when it's a book about cultures coming together and clashing and um, being, what's the word, <laughs> opposed to each other, I don't know. That's something that is done a lot. I don't necessarily feel like this added anything within that sort of 
genre within literary fiction, I guess. But I do think some of the outlooks were quite original from the different perspectives within the different characters with Sloane and Levang and with um, Alva. And then the other one is excellent. And I would say this is a very, very, very good book. I did mention earlier that it is occasionally repetitive, certain terms, certain words come up quite a lot. And I also felt that happened a little bit in terms of the cyclical nature of the relationship. Sometimes they ended up being like, oh, we like each other. Oh no, we really, really don't. Oh, we like each other. Oh no, no, we really, really don't. And that I felt, yeah, there was also something in here, going back to originality, going back to originality, where I felt like I could see a certain storyline coming, which I enjoy as a reader, but actually I felt like it was a bit of a trope that I've seen far too many times in books about young women and older gentlemen they may know. That's all I will say. So yeah, there we go. Very much enjoyed it. And like I said, we'll definitely read more of Orb Ray Lescure's books. What I'm going to read next, but probably won't start until later because the plan is to go and get fish and chips because it's almost sunny outside so go and get fish and chips at my favourite place Parkgate Fish and Chips it's amazing if you ever get the chance go they're phenomenal what I'd like to head to later is something completely different and I decided to stick to the theme of books where the first sentence was a corker and I was really intrigued but wanted to go somewhere completely different and what is fantastic about this selection of books is how varied and diverse they all are. So I'm going to be heading to London in the 1990s with Megan Nolan's Ordinary Human Failings, the first line of which was or is, down below in Skylar Square, the trouble was passing quickly from door to door. Mothers telling mothers, not speaking aloud, but somehow saying, baby gone, bad man, wild animal. I mean, that is a corking <laughs> opening to a book. I haven't read Megan Nolan before, so I have no like prior history with her writing. I've heard from lots of people, she's very good. I think her previous book was quite controversial in some of its subject matter, so I'm expecting this to possibly be a little like that. The cover isn't giving me much, because it's kind of a woman who's evading you looking at her, yet she's directly looking at you. So that intrigues me. Is that what one of the characters is going to be like? I'm not sure. I think it's about a family from Ireland who moved to London and they, on the estate that they move on to, there is the murder of a young girl and in some way they have something to do with that or are witnesses to it. I'm not really, really sure at all. Not really sure. Not really, really sure. Also, I won't lie, I'm heading to something shorter because <laughs> I feel like this took me a little bit longer than I was expecting, partly because of buying Beverly Hills and that's like, which was my fault, not the books. But yeah, I would like to head to few shorter ones. I have heard though that this is not the crime novel that people might think from the description on the blurb but I haven't read the blurb so I don't know and uh, yeah I will catch up with you when I've read the first 50 pages or so. I will see you when I see you but for now I'll leave you with fish and chips. Morning everyone, if you can see the tea stain on my t-shirt, please ignore it because I've had an incident. Anyway, I thought I'd update you on Megan Nolan, well not update you on Megan Nolan, I don't know what she's doing right now, but I thought I'd update you on my thoughts on Megan Nolan's Ordinary Human Failings. I am, it's hard to say loving a book that at its centre is about a murdered child, but... I am loving the writing and I'm loving what Megan Nolan is doing with this book. It's, as I think I mentioned, set in the 1990s in London and a young girl has been found dead by some bins in a, well, on an estate. And there is a prime suspect who is another girl from that estate who is part of a family who we get to meet slowly, um, who have come over from Ireland. I, I, it's tricky one because I don't want to give too much away, although I will say this isn't really a crime novel. It uses a crime as a way of looking at the shoddy, vile world of tabloid journalism as 
We meet this family, Carmel, whose daughter Lucy is the, the main suspect. She's the last person to be seen with the young girl who was killed, Mia. And we meet her brother, Richie, her father, who's a bit absent. We learn about her mother, Rose, who was, as everybody on the stage says, absolutely wonderful. But we also have met Tom, who is a journalist who, by chance, happens to be on this estate the night that this young girl goes missing and then is found. And it's how he... Ugh, I mean, he's gross as a character. Fascinating to read, but really gross. He worms his way into people's lives and he's got this just awful attitude about the working classes and, ugh, I mean, he's a Tory. He, yeah, he, he's... I, I can't speak. He makes me so cross to read him, but also I'm completely, utterly gripped by it because I'm in the mindset of this awful person. And Meg Nolan is using this as a device to really get us into the grit of what the tabloid press was like and is still like, but also how Irish people coming over were treated by British people and the way there were so many assumptions made about them and how this family who are being judged so harshly because of what may or may not happen. I don't know what happened and I don't know if we'll find out, but I I think the way that Megan Nolan is writing about that is just very full on, very direct, incredibly readable, whilst also being incredibly confronting. And I think that is kind of genius. So I'm excited for it. I almost didn't want to go to sleep last night because I just wanted to read and read and read and I'm very excited heading to more of it now. I will say what I think is great is that we have gone back, it's set in different parts, but we've gone back to Ireland to find out more about the family and particularly around Carmel and I won't give any spoilers but that writing is just beautiful. It's actually reminding me a little bit of Trespasses by Louise Kennedy. Anyway, I'm going to uh, get a numb arm shortly, but suffice to say, I'm absolutely loving it and I will catch up with you just over halfway. But I'm going to go back to it now. Oh, I had lovely fish and chips last night, as always at Parkgate, and saw an egret. So there you go. Hi everyone, it is later on and I thought I would have a catch up with you about Ordinary Human Failing so that I am about two thirds of the way through. Still really enjoying it. I think Megan Nolan is a fantastic writer. The way she creates characters and the way you care about them with all their flaws is brilliantly done. How she's kind of almost trying to understand how people end up who they are, be it members of this family that are at the kind of the heart of this incident or whether it is Tom, the odious journalist, who I'm not saying I'm seeing a different side to now. There's definitely some interesting stuff about him that I wish I could go into in more detail here, but I won't because I don't want to spoil it for anyone. But what I have found quite difficult to read, because I'm sure it was true, and that's the awful thing, is how in bed some of the police are with the newspapers, and that I found a bit shocking. Obviously, this is fiction, it's not non-fiction, but you know what I mean, it would have been really, really well-researched. It feels really well-researched. Going back to the 70s in Ireland is really interesting as well. We've been back with Richie now, and I will say what's maybe taken a little bit of an edge off it for me slightly is, whilst I found his story incredibly moving and I won't give anything away, and whilst Megan Nolan is very much, like I said, looking at why people become the way they become, I can't see quite the bearing on the rest of the story. And I feel like we've been taken away from what's going on in the 90s, which made sense with Carmel, but hasn't made so much sense with him. But that said, we're getting to know a family and what they've been through in Ireland before they came over to London and before this awful incident happened. So we'll see. I'll see what happens in the next two thirds. I think I'm going to go and read the rest of this in the bath. And then I think I'm going to watch the original Roadhouse movie. It's been remade with What's His Face McFitty McFitterson in it. And I do want to watch that eventually. But I think I want to watch the Patrick Swayze original first. So a bath then that, and I'll probably catch up with you tomorrow before we have a day out. There are many options possibly tomorrow. We were thinking about Blackpool to go to the Pleasure Beach, thinking about London now and going on the cable car and something we wanted by the sea, but I'm feeling like they're all a bit far away. I feel like doing something close to home, maybe even, dare I say it, another cream tea at a National Trust. I mean, it is my birthday week after all. Morning, Ed. Bad 
brought you some breakfast. Oh, shit. Hi everyone, it's Friday and two things. Firstly, please don't report this video because I shared Patrick Swayze's bottom with you all. I just felt like it was good for all humanity really and why not? So I did a little bit of a cheeky shot there. I did actually really enjoy the film and I'm now hoping that Jake Gyllenhaal does the same thing in the remake. I'll be watching that at some point, but not now. It's Friday morning, did I say that? Yes, I did. And the second of this I was gonna mention was, I've just sat here because I've realized I filmed a lot in the usual place that I film all of my YouTube videos. And I don't know, I always worry that you're bored of that. As you can see, by the way, these shelves need a good sort. Moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on. I have finished Megan Nolan's Ordinary Human Failings. I'm gonna have a chat with you about that in a second, but I thought I'd mention some book posts first because it is Women's Prize related. This is The Wren, The Wren by Anne Enright. I don't particularly like this cover. I'm not sure if I'd even like this book because I have had a mixed relationship with Anne Wright. However, I saw on Instagram the American edition and I had to order myself a copy because I think this is one of the most beautiful covers I have seen. It's gorgeous. So I treated myself to that. It's arrived. I thought I'd share it. I mean, there's just hands down. That is so much better. Anyway, Megan Nolan's Ordinary Human Failings. I thought this was a stunning novel. I am very excited about Megan Nolan as a writer. I can't wait to go and read Acts of Desperation and whatever she writes going forward. I thought this was done with so much heart and humanity whilst being incredibly frank, honest, quite raw in a lot of ways in terms of what she's writing about. As I mentioned, this is, well, the incident, I guess, at the heart of this novel is the murder of a young girl and looking at who may or may not have done it and the family that that person is attached to and then going back to Ireland in the 1970s onwards and finding out about this family who moved there and looking at the way in which they're treated coming to the UK and like by default suspicions suspicions being on them because they're outsiders they're different and as a welcoming and accommodating as we think London can be. It isn't always. And this is set in the 1990s, so there's also that sort of political edge to it. But I thought the way that she wrote this was just amazing. I was so invested in all the characters, flaws and all. There's some really interesting questions morally in here, particularly insightful and hard to read when it looks at the morality or lack of with the press back then, but also it very much applies to the, um, I was gonna say the broadsheets, the broadsheets less so, but like the scuzzy daily papers, you know who I'm talking about. And I think the way that she, Megan Nolan does this with this family is just, yeah, incredible, really powerful. So in terms of accessibility, totally, I, I think it's a really deaf skill to be able to write something so lyrical, so poignant, so, difficult in some ways and yet the language to lure you in in the way that it does I think is brilliant and totally accessible. In terms of originality I would say bang on. Yes I have read stories about families who are ostracised and outsiders coming into new places and I've read books where you go back to a previous time to see what happened to a family or to see how people become the way they become, which is another big theme within this book. I feel like this book has a lot of love in it because Megan Nolan is writing about this family that she clearly loves despite the fact they are, com well, humans are complex, aren't we? The, the way that she writes about these characters with so much love and then also this sort of real rage towards this toxic industry of journalism or how part of journalism is a big part to be fair the, the emotions are very at the fore and it has a real impact so in terms of excellence for writing the third is a criteria for the women's prize i would say this smashes that one completely so this as you may have guessed is a new favorite book 
for me. And like I said, I'm looking forward to going back to Acts of Desperation and then reading whatever Megan Nolan writes next. Really glad to have read this. Now, I don't quite know what I'm going to read next. I'm not actually going to start anything now because I'm off to Chirk Castle shortly for another National Trust property, cream tea and a secondhand bookshop. I'm such a predictable beast. But what I am leaning towards, I think, at the moment is Hangman by Maya Binyam. Now, I don't know anything about this other than I really love the cover. Really, really, really love the cover. I've just slightly got besotted with it and can't look away from it right now. That's what I'm thinking at the moment, but we'll see how I feel after a day out. I've decided to not go in order of the first lines, even though it has done me well so far, but I thought that might get a little bit routine. I feel like it needs to be a bit more whimish. So let's see how I'm feeling when I'm home, but I'll have a catch up with you later and let you know what is going to be next. But until then, here's uh, a big castle and um, probably some cream tea. Oh, and that stringy old classical music. <laughs> Why are you not being in it? <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I am home and after a rainbow-tastic day with a lovely cream tea and a lovely castle with amazing dungeons. Not that that's what I always focus on in the castle, obviously, that sounds slightly weird. Moving on, feeling a little bit worse for wear. So um, I'm going to head to bed with a book. I'm not going to have dinner or anything. I just feel like I need to lie down and sort of, yeah. Anyway, uh, I have picked my next oh, little sneaky peek there. Read, and it's not Hangman. It is Kate Grenville's Restless Dolly Maunder. And I felt after being in a castle, this is a completely different time period, <laughs> that I wanted something historical and wanted to head to an author whose writing I know I really, really enjoy. I love The Secret River by Kate Grenville. So I do have previous with her. I also really loved the memoir about her mother, Nancy. And this is meant to be, this is shows you that I do know a bit about one of the books at least, a fictionalised account of the life of her grandmother, Dolly Maunder, the aforementioned Dolly Maunder. So it's also perfect as well for the Buzzwordathon prompt this month. So yeah, that's um, all that I've realised. I've read Mona of the Manor, which is also perfect for that. So two books for this month's Buzzwordathon prompt. Anyway, moving on, moving on, moving on. I'm expecting great writing. I'm expecting to be really lost in the world that Kate creates. And that's just what I need when I'm feeling a little bit less than myself. So I'll report back. Oh, and what does the cover say? The cover's giving historical novel. Let's be nice. Although for historical novel, it's quite bold and bright. I've noticed, I don't know if you feel the same, a lot of historical fiction is dark greens, dark blues. Yeah, a bit more sort of deep blood red crimson some might say it is much brighter and bolder i don't know if that's trying to nod to the fact it's set in australia or the fact there's going to be a lot of nature in this book maybe but the silhouette that's totally given historical fiction is it let's be honest so uh, yeah this is what i'm going to head to next and i'll report back when i report back also i did get a new bookmark 
a chirk so um, i'm holding upside down here we go i got a new bookmark at chirk and uh, this is the one that i'm going to be using for this book so just keeping you updated on my bookmark collecting collection hi everyone it is saturday uh early evening i've been really ill for the last i'd say about 24 hours i just didn't feel well last night and then was particularly not well this morning chris has just got back <laughs> from work and changed the bed not because i did anything awful in it i've just been sweating a lot let's all move on let's not focus on it but i have been reading well i've been watching quite a lot of heartbreak high the new revamped edition which i think marie cardi who i'm mildly obsessed with is one of the writers on anyway another australian link um but it's very good if you haven't watched it do um i have on that australian link also been reading restless dolly mond that i'm about over halfway, I've been reading quite a lot of it this afternoon, and it's very readable. I'm getting through it very quickly. I, how do I feel about this? So, as I mentioned, it's about Kate's grandmother, Dolly Maunder. So it's about a real person. So it's what do they call that faction? Um, and it's interesting for me that she's written this after the non-fiction that she wrote about her mother because. In some ways, this is feeling very non-fiction-y. It's very much telling you about Dolly's childhood and how she always kind of wanted to be different from what society expected of women in terms of she wanted to be a teacher, she wanted to be independent, she wanted to have a career, and that just wasn't the done thing. And so the book follows her from childhood and getting married onwards and I won't give too much away other than to say there's a lot of and then they went here and they did this and then they got a bit bored of that so then they went and did this and then they got a bit bored of that and then they went and did this anytime there's a big historical moment again it feels like it's not quite fleshed out I want more depth to it and what the characters are really thinking and feeling and I don't feel like I know Dolly that well even though I've spent quite a lot of time with her and also I've really struggled with the age of her children whenever she's talking about her kids I think they're in their teens and then their 20s and then it'll be like Nancy was nine so there's a bit of disconnect there and I do wonder if it's because great great Kenville no Kate Grenville knows this story so well but I feel like it's been lots of like sentences plotted through of what each chapter is going to be and then bumped up a bit, but then moving on. Because, I mean, Dolly Maunder crammed a lot into her life. I mean, we're only in her late 30s, early 40s at the moment. That's how I'm feeling about this so far. I don't know if it's because I've been a bit there, And I've certainly enjoyed reading it and I'm getting through it. But I feel like, for me, from what I remember of Kate's fiction, this prose isn't quite hitting the spot this does feel more factual because it is based on facts I'm aware but like written in a more factual way and I'm like oh this to me feels like maybe it should be on the women's prize for non-fiction long list so controversial I've realized I never caught up on what I thought about the women's prize for non-fiction shortlist and my thoughts are very excited for two of them, quite intrigued by one of them, not sure about the other three. I'll leave you to work out what it is, although I'm doing the Women's Prize Prod Along with Mum on Tuesday, and um, I'm sure we'll be talking about that then. Anyway, so there we go. And um, back to the Women's Prize Fiction long list. I'm, I'm enjoying this, but it's not blowing me away, and I don't think it's Kate Grenville at her best, which is interesting when it's up for this prize, which, she has one before for an idea of perfection, which I really, really loved. I know it's one of Evie Wilde's favourite books. Anyway, there we are. That's that. I'm feeling exhausted again. So I'm going to do a bit more reading, watch a lot more Heartbreak High, and I'll catch up with you hopefully tomorrow. Jesus, Dad! What the hell have you got them into? What do you want to do? Don't bullshit me, Dougie. I didn't ride in on the last dick. Hi everyone, it is Sunday and as you may be able to tell I'm feeling a whole lot better. I'm also back in a shirt, ending the vlog as I started in a shirt and also ending the vlog talking about Australian writing as I did at the start. Wow, we've gone circular. I haven't managed to read 
fall off the long listed books like I was hoping to. So I'm gonna to have to play catch up in the weeks ahead, but I have finished the third of the Women's Prize long listed books for fiction 2024. Restless Dolly Mordor by Kate Grenville. And I did enjoy this. I think at the end there is a, well, two sections where Kate writes about her grandma. You also get a picture of Dolly Mordor, which I really, really love, which I think is the cover of the Australian edition, which I don't think is as nice as this one, if I'm honest. Anyway, there's these two sections at the end of the book where Kate writes about her grandma and writes about silences. And I thought some of that was some of the most powerful writing in here, possibly because I'd read the book, but it certainly added a whole load of context and I guess an extra layer emotionally that I didn't feel the book had until that point. Now, my question here comes in the fact that with the three <laughs> different criteria, excellence is one of them and should those two sections not have been within the prose earlier on to make this book truly excellent. I feel like this needed to be quite an epic. And actually that said, Kate can write epics in, you know, under 350 pages as she did with The Secret River. This for me, there was a lot of fact and a lot of information about Dolly without ever me feeling like I truly got to know Dolly or her family, actually, if I'm really honest. And so for me, this felt oddly, as I mentioned before, like non-fiction instead of fiction. And I think maybe if it had been non-fiction, I would have maybe enjoyed it more, but then it still needed some more of the sort of wallop of history behind it a little bit too. So yeah. That's my thought. So excellence, mm, originality, I think writing about a member of your family is really fascinating. I think the whole originality question is really tricky actually because what's that saying? There isn't anything new under the sun. That causes a little bit of problem. Anyway, I think it's pretty original and I think it is kind of different from what I've read in the historical fiction sphere, partly because it's from Australia. And it is, I should say, an absolute joy that there is an Australian novel on a long list because there needs to be a lot more because Australian fiction is great. That said, I think Kate has written better books. I also think I've read some better Australian books that I would have maybe liked to have seen on the list, which I've not really brought into this and maybe shouldn't. Accessibility wise though, going back to the criteria, the three criteria, because I can do numbers, I think this is really accessible and I think this will give people real insight into Australian fiction and maybe, there's, maybe I've answered my own riddle it will maybe be a jumping off kind of book where you go off and find out more about different periods that are mentioned like the depression and what happened after the gold rush and all those things. So yeah, I thought this was good and I think it matches all the criteria to a degree, probably most in terms of accessibility. Now, I mentioned that it's not my favorite of the ones that I've read so far and I thought it'd be nice to do a little bit of a catch up on the three books. I'm going to do them in order of preference. Now sadly this is my third favourite of the ones that I've read for all the reasons that I've mentioned before. I think it's a good book. I don't think it's her best. I don't think it's one of the best books I've read. So yeah I wanted more historical wallop and I wanted more character depth within it. But I still think Kate Grenville is an incredible writer. This just wasn't my favourite. I feel like I've said that a lot now and maybe that's over breaking a pudding. My second least favourite, but also second favourite, was River East, River West. I thought this was, as I mentioned before, a really solid book, really enjoyed it. It gave me insight into China that I hadn't had before. It, it had that cultures coming together, opposing, uh, repelling. That's the word I was looking for all that time. And you know how many of us sometimes repel each other a certain way, but also cling to each other in other ways. I think maybe there was a little bit of teen a little bit too much teen angst for me occasionally but by the end of it that I've gone and I think actually that was a really powerful story it just was for me the parts about Liu Fang or the alternating parts about Liu Fang were the standout for me I thought that was phenomenal very much enjoyed this though and then we have what is I'm gonna say it one of my favorite books of the year Ordinary Human Failings by Megan Oling. I just thought this was outstanding and 
I want this to be on the shortlist. There, I've said it this early. This is phenomenal. Her writing, incredible. The character's amazing. What she's doing with this novel and what she's saying and what she's making the reader think about is just great and can't recommend this one enough. So there we go. I will be back with another one of these vlogs. I think I'm probably gonna put this up on Tuesday because I'm off out to a family dinner as it is Easter Sunday today. That means that you can go and see the Women's Prize plod along either live after you've watched this or go back and watch it. I'll try to remember to link that down below. I'll be back with another one of these hopefully next Sunday, if not maybe next Tuesday, maybe that's when vlogs are gonna appear. And what can I tease you with? Well, I don't know which of these I'm gonna head to next. I haven't decided. But I can tell you there will be falconry next week, which is why I've refused to shave my beard before I go and see family, because I want to have a bit of an Henry VIII vibe about me when I've got some big eagle on my arm. That's the aim. That's the goal. That's what I'm going for. I hope you've enjoyed this vlog. I hope it wasn't too long for you. Let me know your thoughts on these three, if you've read them so far. Don't let me know about other books on the long list yet. Let's chat about them as I read them, because I am aiming to get the final one of these vlogs up the Sunday before the shortlist is announced so that I can do a shortlist prediction to Tuesday before the shortlist is announced. <sighs> I'd love your thoughts on those and um, let me know what you'd like to see in reading vlogs slash reading journals going forward and I will put the links to the ones that have now vanished down below. Actually, let's just remind me, I need to do a thumbnail. I'm gonna do it in this outfit. Honestly, me in a shirt, it very rarely happens. I will um, love you and leave you. I hope you're reading something fabulous and I will see you all in another video very, very soon. Bye.